So I was thinking, if we sent our world to the doctor um, to do a diagnosis of the symptoms that you see on just, I mean, just grab any paper any day and see all this stuff, what would the diagnosis be? What would be the prognosis? I mean, where's this all going, you know? You see so much crazy stuff going on in our world. We live in a sick, in a dying world. And the question is, what's the underlying cause? And is there a cure? We're gonna look at that today. When you go to a doctor, there's two primary services that they're expected to perform. Doctors, first of all, they give a diagnosis. A diagnosis is the identification of the problem or the illnesses. We go to a doctor to evaluate our symptoms, right? And to come up with a diagnosis to solve the riddle behind the symptoms, okay? A diagnosis explains why we have the symptoms that we have and and hopefully finds an underlying cause. And then the second task of a doctor is to give a prognosis. A prognosis is a, is a prediction about where the problem or the illness will go. When a doctor gives a prognosis, they are giving an opinion about the course of the disease. It's a prediction about the outcome. They predict what would happen without medical intervention and what could happen with intervention, right? And, and they ask the question, and they answer the questions, can the condition be healed, right? Is the condition life altering? Is the condition life ending? We sometimes avoid going to the doctors, right? Because we don't want to know. But the truth is, we need to know. Diagnosis, prognosis, all come from the Greek word gnosis, talking about knowledge. We need that knowledge so that we can extend our life and have a better quality of life. So I was thinking though, if we sent our world to the doctor, what would be, what kind of knowledge would we get from him? You know, what would be the, the, the diagnosis and what would be the prognosis? In order to evaluate the symptoms, it'd be pretty simple. All we'd have to do is give the doctor, you know, the front page of last Sunday's paper. We see how scientists are examining how long immunity will last with, with, this, uh, with this, these vaccines and this pandemic we've been living with. You see this really sad story here about, uh, they're trying to figure out who killed this poor kid, this 12-year-old kid who's just playing in his backyard on Thanksgiving Day and a stray bullet went through the fence and killed him. This is his heart-grieved his heart -grieved mother. And then, you know, experts are saying that U.S. booster efforts lag amid surge in, of infections. Now, within a month, right, or something like that, maybe even less, 75% of the new, you know, COVID infections are coming from this Omicron variant. We don't know what that means. You got agencies sparring with the county over uh, rising water rates, which is indicative of climate change. And then you have this, this, these, this, these problems in Central America and, and, and all this hatred towards these asylum seekers coming up. That's, that's, that's what you got on the front page on Sunday. A lot of symptoms going off there, right? You know, a lot of crazy stuff. And, and it's pretty easy to see that the world is in trouble. There's disunity. There's moral failure. There's arrogance. There's hatreds. There's the pandemic. We had Delta. Then we had Omicron. And we're, we're going to run out of Greek letters here pretty soon, I think. You know, but what is the underlying cause? of all of this stuff, all of these symptoms that we see in the world. If we took the world to the office of the great physician, what would the diagnosis be? Well, we know what the diagnosis is. The, the, his words, his word in the, in the Bible gives it to us. In the book of Romans, he expresses it this way. There's no difference, okay? There's no difference from those inside the faith and those outside the faith. We're all screwed up. Okay, every single one of them, it says in Romans 3, has sinned. We've all screwed up. Look in the mirror. You've done it too, okay? We've all shot, fallen short of God's standard. The presence of sin is, is systemic. What, what the Bible is saying is, is that the presence of this, this corroding effect in our world, this destroying, this life-sucking influence in our world, has infected 
the entire organism and it's metastasized and it affects every aspect of life. The prognosis, well, without intervention, the Bible says this in Romans chapter 6, it says the wages, the payoff of this condition is death. If the condition is terminal. That's what the great physician says. The, pro the prognosis is, hey, what's wrong with us? All the stuff we see in this world and all the stuff we see in our own lives, okay? Uh, it's life altering. It's really, it really is. It's changed. It's not, things are not the way God originally tended them to be. And it's also life ending. Thus the proliferation of funeral homes. You don't need to look any further, right? And, and just like people who avoid doctors, there are tons of people always that want to deny the reality of sin, of this, of this negative, life-sucking influence, this life-destroying influence. They want to do it because they, they say, well, it's too negative, and, and, and it denies the potential good that we also see coexisting in this world. And, and that's true, okay? But, but the reality is, is that there is good, but there's, there's, this, there's this real problem, okay? Well, when a body gets infected, with a terminal disease, okay? And as the disease advances, there are still, there's still much that's positive and good and life-giving in that body and in that person, right? But eventually, the truth of the prognosis, uh, the diagnosis, is, is validated when the body eventually succumbs to the invading enemy of life, right? You know, what I'm saying is, Sin, as the, cause, as the root cause of all the symptoms in the paper that we see all the time, is the best explanation that's out there. I, I, saw, I, saw, I was reading something a while back in, a, in another, another issue of the paper, and they were talking about these scientists. These guys have, have gotten Nobel Prizes for their work, and they're trying to figure out how to solve the problem of death medically, how to avoid the prognosis, and, and, and it, it talks about these scientists who are doing this great work and they're, they're exploring aging and cancers, and, and these are two of humanity's greatest afflictions, right? You know, and, and, and they're, and they're, but they're also seeking insights as to why the human body is not immortal. Now, the work of these scientists is, is, is really important, okay? It's done for the betterment of mankind. It's done to relieve pain and suffering, and, and they're able to cure certain diseases and push back the enemy of death. And, and what they're studying is this, this, um, this balancing act that occurs inside of our DNA between growth and death. There's these things called telomeres at the ends of the strands of our DNA. And what, what they say is they're kind of like, like shoelaces that lose, eventually lose the plastic caps off the end and they start to fray. And, and it starts to limit the amount of time, the, the number of times that our DNA, that cells can be rejuvenated and, and, and results in the decay associated with death and, a, and, and aging. And, and these guys, they're trying to repair the ends of the DNA, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out if they could create immortal bodies, okay? Well, the, you know, the history of science has shown us that the enemy of death can only be pushed back by science. We can live longer lives. We can live better quality life and that type of thing, and that's wonderful work, okay? But no matter what insights science may gain about why we're not immortal, from their physical evidence, okay, the, the mechanisms that they study and all this kind of stuff. What I want to say to you is science will never solve the bigger question. They'll never be able to answer the biggest question that can only be found outside of the scientific disciplines, okay? The answer to why we're not immortal can't be answered by the scientists. It has to be answered by the theologians. And what theologians tell us is that the great physician, the one who planted us here on this earth, and the one to whom we will return, has indeed considered the symptoms that we see on the front page of the paper, that we see in our own lives, and, and all the stuff that gets messed up in life, and he's, he's given a diagnosis. And as I said before, it's, there's no difference. We're all the same. There's no difference between people in the faith and those outside the faith. Everybody has screwed up. All have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. But the great physician has determined that, this, this, that the presence of sin is systemic. It's affected the entire organism. Every aspect of life is involved. And he's given this prognosis because of that. 
that without intervention, the condition is terminal. The wages of sin, the payoff that we receive because of this, this infection that we have is death. It's a terminal condition. Now, science can only describe the symptoms. Okay, We can see it all over the place. Theologians can, can figure out the root causes of this condition. So, what's the solution? You know, the idea is, can, can disease be cured, okay? It, well, God says there is a treatment. There is a treatment. With intervention, the problem of sin can be arrested, and it can be cured. And what the story is, the way the story goes in the scriptures, is that this intervention occurred in a kind of house call that the great physician, the God, the great physician, made to this earth. And it's what we celebrate during the Christmas season. Now, there's no greater fear, um, no greater enemy than the fear of death. And that's why we spend all kinds of research money, you know, trying to push back death. We have Salk Institutes and all these great institutions for the betterment of mankind. And, but there was a group of people who are part of the Christmas story that feared death. I want to read it to you. It's recorded in Luke chapter 2. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So everybody had to go to their own hometown to be counted and to register. And so Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to this town called Bethlehem. It was the town of David because he belonged to the house and the lineage of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to come, the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And then there were some shepherds. They were living out in the fields and, and nearby, and they were keeping over their flocks by night. They didn't know what was going on over there, you know, in, in the barn. and, and uh, but all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, all kind of glowy and bright and stuff. They were terrified. It went from night to bright like that. And these guys were just freaking out. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I bring to you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior, the Savior, the one you've been expecting, has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll know you found him. You'll find a baby wrapped in claws, lying in a manger. Now, they were terrified, right? They were, they were scared. Why? They were scared to death, right? They, 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 were, they were scared of death. They thought there were crazy stuff was happening and stuff that would make you think you were going to die. And it made them really afraid. But the object of their fear, this angel that appeared, this glowy angel, settled them down and said, don't be afraid. As a matter of fact, I'm here, and, and it's really good news that I'm here, and it's good news that I have for you. The Savior, the one who's going to bring the cure, has been born. The Messiah, the Lord, the one the Hebrew Scriptures predicted would come to solve the problems of the world, to solve the solution that we can't solve, this, this problem of sin and death. The angel said, the time is now. It's good news, and it's time for great, great joy. Have a party, because Jesus is the cure for a sick and dying world. And Jesus, God himself, made a house call to come and do the repair. Now, here's the thing. I love, it's, it's amazing the stuff that biological scientists accomplish and the, thing, the good that they bring to humanity, but they can't cure the problem of, of, this, of death. Okay, Psychologists and sociologists, can't solve all that's wrong inside of a human person's emotions and mind and all that's wrong in our society, they won't be able to solve it. Economists can't do it. Maybe it'll be the politicians. Are you kidding me? The politicians? Give me a break, okay? Problem with political solutions is they always will fall short because they're always dependent on the cooperation of those who are infected with the disease. And it's those who are infected with the disease that are coming up with the ideas for the solutions and stuff. But the birth of Jesus represents the coming of someone who doesn't have the disease and has the power to bring the cure. This is the way the writer, of the, the writer of the book of Hebrews summarized it in ch chapter 2, in verses 14 and 15. He said that Jesus came, he shared our humanity. Somehow, 
God in flesh. Somehow that happened. So that by his death, that he was born to die, he would break the power of the one who holds the power of death. That is the enemy of our soul, Satan. And, and, and Jesus, this one who was born, that was, shares our humanity, will free all of us who are held in slavery by the fear of death. Christmas is all about the coming of the cure. It's, it's good news. It's great joy. It's the coming of the one who shared in our humanity. It's a holiday of joy because it's a celebration of the one who came to break the power of the one who holds the power of death, the enemy of our soul, and, and to set us free from the fear of death. Now, that's really good news. Agreed? You know, that's really good. That's reason for great joy. And, and, and now, but here's what's real. Okay, what we celebrate is, is, is we celebrate all that, but here's the thing, we're still stuck in this world right now, right? We, we still live in a world that does this balancing act, okay, between growth and decay, okay? Growth and death, okay? So much good that can be accomplished, but always it's counteracted by all this negative stuff. Where the telomeres at the end of the strands of our DNA um, that limit the number of times our cells can be reproduced, and, and, and it results in this decay that's associated with aging and eventually our physical deaths. And, and, but still we celebrate. We celebrate because we believe that the fraying, that though our DNA frays, okay, that, that it won't fray our souls, okay? Oh, our physical bodies die and decay because the Jesus has come to offer us this life, even when that happens, okay, we will live, we will continue on. And, and the, that's why the Apostle Paul said, he said, oh, death, where is your sting? Is that all you got, man? Is that all you got? When death comes, you come on the backside of that and you realize you're still alive, you're alive in ways that you never even knew were possible. Now, through de there's disease in our world, there's, there's the pandemic, there's prejudice, there's wars, there's, there's immorality. And, and you face all this stuff and you, you hear about it out there in the world and then you, you see it in your own family, in your own circle of friends, in your community, in your own life sometimes, you know. And, and, and here's the thing, it can get us discouraged, it can make us angry, it can make us fearful, but we can celebrate that this one came into the world to share our humanity, and that we, we don't have to fear those, Jesus said, who can kill our bodies. We don't have to fear that which can and eventually will destroy our bodies because that, that, those, that force can't kill our soul because Jesus is the protector of your soul. He's the one that could toss you, you know, in the, in the, in the burning hot place, or bring you up into heaven and stuff, and, and he, can, he can destroy you, both body and soul, okay? But he's also the one, he says, hey, you're my friend. You're my friend. I love you, and that's why I came, and I want to be in relationship with you, and I want to deliver you from the fear and the actual eventuality of death. So that's, that's a reason for celebration of great joy. And I want to give you some, some suggestions you know, to take into this new year, okay, a practical response to all this kind of stuff. You and I personally can't cure what's all going on, all the stuff that's going on in the world, okay? I can't cure disease, and, and I can't stop climate change. I, I'm, not, I'm not advocating apathy in these things. We, we need to do what we can, okay? But the reality is, is we can't solve all the big problems of the world. We can't on our own solve human trafficking and the dark hearts that make that happen. We can't, we can't, we can't ferret out all the terrorists in the world and all the crazy stuff that people do to each other and stuff. We can't, we can't deal with, with, you know, all this kind of stuff. But what I mean is, I'm not advocating apathy, just realism, okay? We can help lessen the symptoms of the disease. But the cure is beyond our ability. But what we can do is we can point people to the cure. We can point people that say, hey, this is the best solution that's ever come down the pipe. There's nothing I've ever read, there's nothing I've ever heard that, 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 can, that is better than what Jesus offers. That Jesus is the cure for his sick world. 
It's our job to put our trust and our hope in Him. We can long for that day when the lion and the lamb are going to take a nap together, right? You know, when swords are going to be refabricated into plows and, and gone are going to be the days of physical and, and psychological pain and, and when disease and death and decay are no more, okay? But in the meantime, we embrace the joy. We embrace the hope. We, we exude joy and we point people to the cure, the real cure. It's not going to come from our government. It's not going to come from our economy. It's not going to come from anywhere else but from Him because He's the one that came into our world to bring the cure. It's God's job, in other words, to solve the great over overarching problems of our world. Only God could bring joy in that way. But in the meantime, it's our job to apply the cure in, in our own world. Right? There's a sense in which only, only I can bring joy to my world and only you can bring joy to your world. Okay? It, it's, it starts with owning your part of the problem. It starts with humility. Back about a long time ago, probably 100 years ago, maybe 80 years ago, the Times of London sent an inquiry out to a bunch of really famous authors and they asked them a question, what's wrong with our world today? What do you see as being wrong with the world today? To which this famous Catholic theologian and philosopher and poet named G.K. Chesterton said this, wrote back, he said this, Dear Sir, I am yours, G.K. Chesterton. He said, what's the problem in the world today? I am. He owned his own stuff. And, and, and that's part of the problem in our world today. We're always pointing out to other people their stuff. The reality is, man, own your own stuff. And, and God, Jesus, who the one that came into the world to offer the cure, he said that's the entry point into, the, into, into this happy place, is own your stuff and humble yourself and say, Lord, I'm, I'm the problem. Please help me, save me, heal me. And then after he does that, well, if you have faith in him, let it inform your face, okay? Bring, bring joy into the world. As imperfectly as you're going to do it, do it by eliminating, ruthlessly eliminating discontentment in your life, you know? Instead, nurture, nurture an attitude of contentment. Say, God's got this. You know, focus on what you have rather than what you want. Eliminate stinginess in your life. Giving, because a generous heart is a joyful heart. Eliminate ruthlessly hurry out of your life because a hurried life eventually degrades into a joyless life. Bring joy into the, in your world, into your new year by, by reading the scriptures, by listening to Christmas music for an extra week this year or something like that. Watching a fire instead of the TV. You know, learning to love life again reclaiming a sense of wonder about the beautiful place that you get to live with the beautiful people that surround you. Rediscover the simple pleasures. Play with the box instead of the toy, right? Give away happiness in the belief that it might be regifted, and maybe even come back, back on you. Eliminate guilt from your life by doing life God's way instead of the way you've been doing it. And connecting with Him because the Spirit-controlled life the Bible says, produces joy. Choosing joy, being joyful always, the scriptures say, praying continually, giving thanks in all circumstances, no matter what happens, be thankful, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you that you brought the cure into the world. And because of that, because of our belief and our sincere hope that we place in that, Teach us to always be joyful, always be prayerful, and always be thankful that Jesus came to bring the cure. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Jesse, and I'm so glad you joined us today. I hope the message was helpful. Ridgeview Church meets on Sunday mornings in person at 9.30 a.m., and we also have Kids Club. We'd love to see you. We also have midweek discovery groups that meet both in person and on Zoom. Send us an email at info at rcvc.life to learn more. Info at rcvc.life is also the best way to get in touch with us to learn more about our faith community or to let us know how we can pray for you and support you. 
rcvc.life is also where you can learn how you can support the work of our ministry. We need your financial gifts more than ever. And we promise if you entrust us with them, we will put them in good use in providing others with the help and hope they can enjoy in Jesus Christ.